Well, the subject this morning is to talk, speak wisely and well. And um, if you know the book of Proverbs, you know that there's so much in the book of Proverbs about speaking. And so we'll just touch on it this morning. But uh, just to read a few verses from uh, the 12th chapter, just a few verses. Uh, We'll read from verse 17. A truthful witness gives honest testimony, but a false witness tells lies. This is Proverbs 12, 17, now 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only for a moment. There is deceit in the hearts of those who plot evil. But joy for those who promote peace. No harm befalls the righteous, but the wicked have their fill of troubles. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. And then verse 27, verse 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Well, that is God's word. And I was reading this week a story about a professor, professor at Pacific, um, has used the Pacific University in California, a man called Dr. Gary Black, friend of Dallas Willard. And the the, the interesting thing, as I read the book, which struck me, was really about his grandmother. Now, his grandmother uh, was raised in the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, and in a very poor um, family, and then uh, she was had to bring up her own child in very poor, uh, poor circumstances, and uh, this child was this man's father. But anyway, Gary becomes a Christian, and he, he, he is called to the ministry. But he used to go and visit his grandmother, and, uh, and she was always interested in him. Um, and she, and, but she was, she'd been brought up in poverty, but the, the thing about her was once, uh, as a young woman, a young married woman, a toddler, she, she went to this meeting, and she was, uh, met, she met with God. And um, she, uh, she remembered the night when she had this um, uh, experience that she describes an overflowing of emotions and uh, ecstatic uh, Awakening somewhere deep within her, and she, and the the preacher, the visiting preacher to this little church, said, "Well, it was she had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and for the next sixty years she would constantly regale people of about this experience, and she obviously felt and knew that Jesus loved her, and uh, and she would tell people about this person. She would seek to win them to the Lord, and and uh, not only that, she." started going to church. She went Every time the church doors opened, she would go to church. She was addicted to Christianity. She read everything there was. She cut things out of periodicals, stuck pictures on the wall of Jesus, etc., etc., etc. Her entire life was centered around the Christian culture. Now, here's the deal. None of her family would have any problem with that. She was slightly unbalanced as regards her interest. A popular, or the problem was her character. Her character. She was predictably, I quote, mean, angry, vengeful, and bigoted. She stubbornly held on to clearly inaccurate and detrimental opinions. For instance, she, she never appreciated or respected anybody, any teacher, pastor, preacher, from any other denomination apart from her own. And... Um, and when her uh, uh, son and daughter-in-law tried to look after her in her older age with uh, emotionally and mentally and spiritually and physically, she just repaid it with endless ingratitude and, uh, and bitterness. It was, um, it was strange, he said. But um, a gossip, he said, let me quote, could reach the level of a flamethrower. There, she, there were times when she would start in on a member of the family or a neighbor, and my wife would have to take our children out of the room. There was a brutal side to my grandmother that was very disturbing. 
But she could talk for hours about deep and meaning, spiritual things, about the Bible, salvation of the church. And so it goes on. Frightening. Frightening. And, and he says, you know, she'd be talking about spiritual things and then she'd exhibit an unbelievable level of arrogance, anger and bitterness and, and, and vengeance. He said, I could only describe it as spiritual Tourette's. Now, I mentioned that. It's a caricature. But the point is, it's very easy to believe that we can become Christians and stay the same. And we have this cosmic car wash at the end when everything will be clear and fine, everything fine. That it, there is a sense, not a sense of fact, that it's true that we will be made clean. But the will of God is that we are radically changed now. That we live differently the moment we become a follower of Jesus Christ. And we start talking differently. You can't get away with what she did. If your theology allows that, you're in heresy. Now, if we time to look through the uh, book of Proverbs, it says in the tongue has the power of life and death. And uh, it is, uh, rightly said, the most powerful muscle in the body. That we exercise every day, most of us. And, uh, but the mouth, as our Lord says, is simply an overflow of the heart. From out of the heart, from within, says Jesus, comes evil thoughts, etc. So, if I was empty, I won't pull this out because there's another service after this. But every, if I pour this out, what comes out is what's in. So if I'm to change, I have to change what's in. And that is really what it's about. And you see, because we come with patterns of thought and patterns of speech, I'm not even aware of. I was talking to somebody this week about fostering. And they said the, sad, the hardest thing about fostering, they found when, when the foster children were in the house, wasn't simply the swearing, but the abuse and the disrespect that came out. It wasn't their fault in one sense. They'd obviously been brought up in that culture. Now, in the same sense, when we become believers and followers, we have to radically change our speaking. And therefore, we have to change our heart. And um, Solomon, you see here, and he writes most of the Proverbs, is speaking to God's covenant people. This is not uh, a, a book of text to stick on your wall for anybody. This is, this is written to God's people. It's actually written to his sons. Rehoboam is the son who became king, and he was a four-star fool at the end. He didn't, even, he didn't believe, he didn't obey what his father told him. So it's not automatic. And, um, but God's desire is to have a people who will reflect his character. And um, So how are we to do this? Well... As we Neil reminded us last week, you remember Solomon at the beginning of his life, the Lord said to him, in a dream, ask for whatever you like. And Solomon said that he desired a discerning heart to judge your people, that he could judge between, distinguish between right and wrong. And God gave him that gift, and he wrote 3,000 proverbs, as many, and many other wise things he said. But how does it happen? How does it come? Well, let's go back again to the first chapter, because this is going to run right through the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of chukmah, wisdom, knowledge. And he repeats it again in the ninth chapter. The fear of the Lord, he keeps repeating it again and again and again and again. King of wonders, that's what it's about, isn't it? The fear of the Lord. And um, we, we, we begin by closing our mouths. That's how you begin Christian life, by sh shutting your mouth. That's what Paul says to the Romans. That every mouth be silenced and the whole world held accountable. In other words, we find when we become a Christian that God has found us out. We are selfish, self-centered, rebels, lustful, lazy, greedy, proud. With in us, there's a mire, there's a slough of filth and stuff. And God has caught us. And we're not defending ourselves and saying, what a great guy I am, what a great person I am. No, no, every mouth is stopped, says Paul. 
That's the sign you're a Christian. You've stopped arguing and you've come to this position. And we come to, and we face this great God we've been singing about. This God who created a hundred billion galaxies. He, he thought of, just think, he thought of this concept of this universe. And then with a word, he calls it into being. This is the God before whom we come. The God who is, is righteous and just. Who governs the world with infinite justice and righteousness. Who will judge us. He will judge everything you've said and done. Every word and every deed will be judged by his eternal righteous standard. The writer of Proverbs says, Be sure of this, the wicked, that's us, the unbelievers, will not go unpunished unless we avail ourselves of his grace and mercy. We stand before this infinitely pure God before whom the very heavens are not pure before whom the very unfallen angels cover their faces and cry holy, holy, holy this is the God we come before and, uh, and, we, and we come before him and ask for wisdom now this is the God we, we, this is where it starts now we live in a God shrinking age where truly it's been said God Almighty has become God Almighty he's our you know just Our servant, he does what we want. You know, the man upstairs, he'll do whatever we ask. No, no, no. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the center and the end of wisdom. It's this awesome God that we stand before. You see, you've got to center on this. It's like, you know, if you've ever done any pottery, you get some clay and you throw it on the wheel. And you start to throw your your vase or your uh, vessel, whatever you're making. But unless you center it, it wobbles and it, you cannot do it at all. You might start again. That is the Christian. All the time you have to center on the greatness and the glory and the awesome wonder of God. Not on Sundays and sing these great hymns that Mark and Kate have led us through. No, no. It's every day. The fear of the Lord. That's how it starts. And, um, and we, we distrust our own thoughts. We, we are willing to... Uh, Um, have our mind changed and so our thinking and we receive God's word the psalmist says I am more insightful I'm more wise than my teachers because I meditate on your statutes if you want to stay as a fool my friends stay off the word of God if you want to live your life as a fool keep off the, the Bible it's the only way to become wise that's why there are many fools around but we Remember in James says, if you ask for wisdom, he gives liberally, without reproach. We ask for just as Solomon as a young man, he asks for wisdom. The sad thing about Solomon, he stopped asking. The end of his life was a disaster almost. Every day we ask for wisdom, and um, and he gives it. And uh, now we looked last week, Neil looked last week at wisdom. Let me just remind you what wisdom is. How are we to speak wisely? Wisdom is not knowledge. It's not ability. It's not intelligence. It's not even genius. No, no. You can have all these things and still be a a four-star fool. It is the power and the ability to apply those things, to apply the knowledge you have, the ability you have, the, the, the intelligence you have. It's not knowing all the answers, and then I can speak clearly. It's like driving a car. You're driving a car. Wisdom is not telling you why, why everything is as it is. You know, you're driving down a lane in Buckinghamshire. Why is this lane so twisty and windy? Why is this T-junction here? Why did this idiot park his car there? Why does this person so lovingly hug the center of the uh, road? Why, why, why? Wisdom is not getting an answer to all those things. Wisdom is the ability to make right responses as you drive. That's wisdom. It's not having all the answers. It's making the right responses to each situation. And and we realize that we have to change. We have to ask for wisdom. We meditate on the Word. And we live in the presence of God. And we have consciously to make an effort to change friend of mine had a, a very serious stroke. He couldn't speak at all. But it was amazing. Within 18 months, with the help of speech therapists, he could speak perfectly acceptably and normally. 
And we have, to, we have to consciously change our speaking. The trouble is we don't realize how we speak. We, we pick it up from our parents. Sometimes we don't say anything, which can just be as wrong. I always think that uh, the tongue and money should be on the alpha course <laughs> for young Christians routinely. Right at the beginning. Now, we, we looked last week, Neil looked last week, that words are very powerful. He used the side of the illustration that you remember of Gerald Ratner, who built his, his jewelry business up for 25 years, and in two sentences, down Buckingham Palace Road, a director's business meeting, he lost it. He lost 150, 500 million, and he lost his job. Just because he said some st- a stupid two sentences. Now, it's true. The tongue has the power of life and death. It can end marriages. It can destroy lives. Just words. They're so powerful. That's why you have to address them. And the psalm, the, sorry, Solomon says, reckless words pierce like a sword. And we all know that. Some of us have done marriage counseling in the past. And you talk to people and say, why did you say that? Why did you say that to her? Well, it was true. I know it was true. But it wasn't very wise, was it? Oh, no, I suppose not. But it's all the time. Why do you say that? Didn't you think? Those who guard their mouths, says Solomon, and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. You see, how do fools act? How do wise people act? A fool acts out of... um, uh, let's put it, it's feelings. It's, that's the thing, feelings. Well, you know, why did you vote for so-and-so? Oh, he was such a lovely man. It was, I mean, it was such, but did you not see what he believed? I know, but he was such a lovely man. You, you, it's your feeling, well, he was so nice, and he kissed the baby as well, you know. A fool acts out of, Desire, you know, I have to have it. I have to do it. Yeah, well, what? It's it's not wise. No, I must have it. It's like a marriage. I had to have this one. We, we were in love. I had to do it. But you walked out of your marriage. Yeah, I know. But my heart was telling me. I was a fool. A fool acts out of feelings, out of desire. A fool is governed by instincts and impulses. I just, I just got this idea. I had to do it. I don't read books. You know, I just did it. I had to do it. Just got this thing feeling. Now, I'm not against feelings or desires or impulses, but they must always be governed by truth and reason. Now, likewise, a fool is, is governed by, by zeal and enthusiasm. Now, there's nothing wrong with zeal and enthusiasm, but it's simply the way you do a thing. It must be governed by truth. We're driving up to Dover, and we're belting along the M6, and say, this is great. And some lady says to me, do you not think we're going the wrong direction? We're going northwest. I know, but we're going so well. We're really making progress. We're really, you know, the car's running well, the road's clear. We're going for it. I'm enthusiastic, but I'm going the wrong direction. And all these things have to be checked before we open our mouths. And the fool also never considers consequences. He lives for the moment. Always impatient, you know? Got to have it, got to do it. You got to stop and think and listen. We rush into things. We do so much damage because of, why did I say that? Now, the wise person is not simply cautious. The wise person is not somebody who says nothing. I think the, song, the Bible says you can appear a wise man if you say nothing. <laughs> you want to try it sometime, you know? No, no, the, the wisdom, silence is the virtue of fools, as Francis Bacon said. No, no, the wise man thinks before he speaks and acts. The wise person has a contribution to make, and we have to speak. It's sometimes hard, unpleasant, and unpopular. We have to say things. Any parent knows that. You have to say things. You don't say, well, let, let them do what they like. No, no. Parenting, you have to say the right thing. But the wise person always examines every situation and and, and ideas and all the evidence. He listens. He's supremely a good listener. And you look at the whole 
situation and slow down. And you weigh all in the light of the Bible, the, the truth of the scripture. You weigh this. I'm not, we're all for speaking. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom and, and just good sensible words, etc. But you have to weigh them. And, and, and how shall we speak then? I mean, what we have to do is to keep ourselves out. I remember Lloyd, Martin Lloyd Joswell said, the secret of wisdom is, is to keep oneself out of things. But we have to be honest. We have to be honest. We, there are many headings we haven't time to go into. But we have, first of all, to be honest. The Lord detests lying lips, but delights in people who are trustworthy. Now, we've all worked for situations where, tell them I'm not in, but you are in. Tell them, tell them we sold the car. Tell them, but it's not true. I remember a young Christian in the north of England. He, he, he was working for a garage, and um, they sent a billion, and, uh, and um, tell them we put a new clutch in. But we didn't do that. Tell them. If you don't tell them, you're, you're down the road. Well, this poor chap has just become a Christian. And he was down the road. Better lose your job than the blessing of God, my friends. Better to lose, you know, the, the deal than, you know, your character. And that's what he's saying. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue only for a moment. Oh, you'll get the deal. You'll get the contract. Just be economical with the truth. Lie a bit. Exaggerate a bit. You'll get the deal. You'll get the job. You'll get promotion. But it will catch up with you, and you'll lose the blessing of God, and you become a liar. And that's what he's saying. You see, the <laughs> lying lips, says Solomon, are an abomination to the Lord. The Lord detests lying lips. So the essential characteristic of the Christian life is truth. We are people of the truth. The characteristic of the non-Christian life, of the unbelieving life, is dishonesty. In one sense, it's deceit. It's cover. It's sham. It's image. It's what you can get away with. But the essence of the Christian life is truth. Paul says, he who wants to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We are truth people. You see, we follow a God who is light and in him is no darkness at all. He is essentially, everlastingly, eternally truthful. It's, it gives me great comfort. The sense of this universe is one who is absolutely righteous and truthful. I can sleep at night because of that. Whatever is on the news... There is a God who is totally trustworthy, who never changes, who's the father of lights and doesn't change like shifting shadows. No, no. The fear of him is the beginning of wisdom. And we cannot lie because we've come to the truth. We are not followers of the devil who is a liar and the father of lies. It's, and it causes such unhappiness. It always catches up with you, know. There's lying and pretense. No, no. It's all through self. You see, we want to be thought well of. We want people to speak well of us. We want to be praised. We want to be liked. We want to have a good reputation. And so we, we, we work on our self-importance. We want this good opinion. I mean, this isn't superficial. This is very serious. Isn't it interesting? You know, the Bible, the New Testament starts with, it's amazing, it's wonderful. And then right in the middle, God's, after the resurrection, God sends the Holy Spirit. Boom! And the three, just 3,000 saved one day. It's glory, wonderful. Oh, to be alive in those days. It was heaven, as it were. Wonderful. People have been saved, healed. And, but right at the beginning, two people, Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira tell a lie to the church. And the Lord God dr kills them. He drops them, they, they, dry, they drop dead. He, he, he puts them to death. You think, blow. Everything was going so well. Look, we don't need that. 
What God is saying is this. The church I am forming on this earth will be a church of righteousness. I will not tolerate. Get that into your hearts and heads right at the beginning of what I'm building. I will have a people who reflect my righteousness and my truthfulness and my love of truthfulness. And that's what it's about. You see, we're no longer children of the devil. We're no longer children of the night. We're no longer children of darkness, of, of, of sham, of pretense. No, no. We are children of God. We're children of the light. We're children of, of truth. And we are called to be like our Father. And that's what it's about. The Lord delights in men and women who are truthful. He delights in it. He abominates lying lips. He detests it. Do you get the passion that, that Solomon is trying to convey about the Lord he has met? Now our call then is to be not only truthful, it's called to be thoughtful. And uh, rec- reckless lips pierce like a, a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. <laughs> Isn't it true I would have been hurt by words? I can think of words that were said to me 60 years ago by other schoolboys. And you know, I could smile and laugh it off and give a, a repost which is equally vicious. But you know, the wound went in. Some of you can remember when, you know, perhaps your parents or friends or others said things to you which should never been said to you. I can remember things that were said. I can remember fa- our family was split for 20 years. Over one argument one night. The pain that that caused was immense. And, um, but words heal. That's the great thing. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Healing. You have power, my friends, to heal. Not just by the laying out of hands, but by the speaking of your tongue. It brings healing. And, um, and so you have to actively think. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, a spring of life. But you have to think. You have to make an effort. Well, I'm a quiet introvert. Well, you have to work harder then, maybe. To think of words of encouragement, words of truth. And when, when, when have I to be like this? I'll let me just give. It's just very simple. It's called today. The writer of Hebrews says, Encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. It's called today. It's a Sunday, but we do still call it today. Just do it. You know, to your spouse, you do it every day. You tell them, I love you. Every day you feed into them, you build them up, you bless them. Every day. Whether you're feeling romantic or not. With your children, every day you build them up. And they need most encouragement when they least deserve it. I'm not talking about flattery. You know, you're the most intelligent child in Buckinghamshire. They know they're not the most intelligent child in Buckinghamshire. But you say, thank you for doing that. Thank you for working, doing your, whatever you did. Praise, praise, praise. Well, he'll get a big head. No, he won't, my friends. That's the lie of the devil as well. No, no. Think consciously. God has given me these children. They may actually be 40 now, but you still have to encourage them. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Even adult children get depressed, right? I see I am right. Every day. We need encouragement. But my parents never did. I do not say this graciously, care what your parents did. You are a child of the living God. You've been born again into this family which talks differently. You know, my parents are very quiet. I, I bless your parents, but you are now a child of God. You have to constantly, how can I bless my spouse? How can I bless my work colleagues? How can I bless my, you have to do it. It's command, I, if I had time, I could give you a thousand texts. And that's not an exaggeration in the scriptures. Just do it. Now, it, 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 need, it takes effort. Some things are not easy to say. I remember when I was just married, and a friend of mine stayed, oh, I really love this guy, lovely Christian. 
And he came the following week. I thought, what's he come back to see me for? And he lived in Essex. Who can live in Essex? Miles away. And he came back and he said to me, Stuart, I really didn't think that was the way you should talk to a Christian. Now, he could say it. But I thought, he's come all this way, played all this bus face, train fare. And I, yeah, I could receive it from him. No, we would only be married a few years. I'm so grateful. Because I was talking to her probably like how my mother talked to me. You know, turn the lights on, all that stuff. You do all, you know, you tell, you talk to your wife as if they're five-year-olds. Well, you wouldn't do that. I don't do that now. But, <laughs> but you know, you've got to think. I'm so grateful. It, it, it must have been hard for Tony to come and do that. But I'm so grateful. And sometimes you have to do it. Not that you'll win favor, but because it's the will of God. We're not here. Well, they may not think well of me. They may not. But actually, the right thing to do is to say it. Sometimes you have to say things. And, and your reputation is not, is not the issue. It's their blessing, their health. Somebody has to say it. And God will honor that. You see, an anxious I must come to a close. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Just say it. Make sure you have, and let me just say this, make sure you have fellowship with people who are like this. Some communities and, and groups of people, men and women, just so negative. Make sure you live with people who are positive. I'm so grateful as a young Christian that I was able to always have all the Christians as friends. And they set a standard for speech. Their language is totally different. And they used to have this great text from Malachi 3.16, uh, the King James Version. Those who fear the Lord spoke often one to another. And I do it. I thought, let's get all I can out of these people. You know, the great blessing of this church was my dear friend, Frank George Matthews. My dear friend, Frank. One of the reasons why this church is such a blessing and has been was the mouth of my friend, Frank. He set a standard that was special and unique. And if he would say, not from, not from the pulpit, he, he did speak wise from the pulpit, just one to one, so the words of Frank, of encouragement and uplift and cheer and bless and rebuke, I have to say. <laughs> it set a standard. We, we, he would, we would do well to follow that, to put it mildly. Final thing is this Simon Ponsonby's book. One of his books, I forget which it was. He talks about simulacra, which is, I'll tell you what it is. You know what it is. It's, uh, you know, you see uh, an oven cloth and somebody's burnt it. And then you look at it and you see a picture of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And, uh, it, uh, or else it, you, uh, you know, a window, it quotes a window in Florida. You take a picture and just something about the light it's just the face of Jesus. Or a, a burr on a tree. It, it takes a picture just like Jesus. Jesus formed there. Or some, uh, the bark of a maple tree. It, you see the picture of Jesus. Or um, he says, some fish fingers. He says, and they took this picture of fish fingers. It just looked like the face of Jesus. And, and the, the other one was some banana peel. You could see the face of Jesus in this picture. Or others, it was some sliced orange. You could see Jesus was formed. I, I don't know, miracle, I don't know. And others, there was one, um, some naan bread. They made this naan bread, you know, it's cooked. And, and it just looked like the face of Jesus. And then there was another one, was a pancake. And it was just, Jesus' face had been formed in it. The point is this. Simon is saying this. We have to look. We are looking in the wrong place to find the, Jesus. We, we, we should look among the people of God. That the, that the character and the nature of Jesus should be seen there. Where can we find the face of Jesus? Where can we find the lips and the heart of Jesus? In the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we look for. Not in any banana peel or naan bread, my friends. In you, that we speak the words of God. We speak the truth of God. When shall we do it? Today. So we bless. We affirm. We encourage. We cheer.
cheer up, whatever it takes, today. While it's still cold, it'll be cold today till 12 o'clock tonight. So you have to live till 12 o'clock tonight, then you start again tomorrow. Encourage you that. The tongue of the wise brings healing. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. 